right we're live so we would just carry on talking thank you so have you had all the thunderstorms and rain and oh man you been okay we? no we've had all the thunderstorms fortunately uh so the love of my life is my dalmatian uh unfortunately he's quite a chilled uh chap um so um he wasn't bothered about the thunder and then uh, the only problem i had was the other night when it was raining so hard it took about five goes till about two in the morning before he'd actually go outside <laughs> go to the loo before he went to bed so he's like looking i'm not going out there so uh yeah but um i think we've had a pretty good summer really i'm not complaining we've had uh, a lot of good walks a lot of good uh, i live in a little village so i'm very lucky um and uh, yeah we've had a we've found loads of new walks and things to do which has been lovely lovely hi andy thanks for joining so andy's joining from fetford we've got andy joining from fife in um scotland which is nice is it, so is thanks very much. no it's andy overman <laughs> <laughs> but no so firstly um kate thanks so much for giving up your time i appreciate it um and uh, let's introduce you. I mean, I've got your book here, and there's like about a two-page introduction. So I think this is, I think this is I think this is going to take my whole um, whole interview. But so, Kate, one of the leading um, UK independent property experts, market analyst, industry consultant, Kate advises professional bodies, government, and works with many leading property companies, including agents, developers, mortgage, insurance, prop tech and various industry bodies to help them improve their consumer offering. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to tell us, tell us a little bit about your story. And um, hi, Chris. Thanks very much for joining as well. So tell us um, your story and how you got how your interest in property and helping the consumer um, started and came along. OK, I kind of start there, actually, because I, I kind of like um, went into the working world in early 90s. And um, I was quite lucky. I landed a very good job at uh, Unilever. Um, so I got fantastic sales and marketing training. Um, but I was in Croydon. And for anybody that knows Croydon back in the early 90s, the market was diving badly and Croydon was really suffering. Um, and I, I'm the youngest of three. So my brother and sister had got on the property market in 89 and they'd both gone into negative equity. And uh, I remember just thinking that's not going to happen to me. So part of my job was I was actually a oh, just basic salesperson, to be honest. And I used to sell PG tips and Frey Bentos and Oxo cubes and stuff like that. And uh, so I was good at I got very good. I had these most amazing guys teach me how to negotiate. And that was like one of the best skills ever um, to give me. So uh, I couldn't, interestingly, I couldn't afford to get on the housing ladder on my own because I don't know if you remember then, everybody whinges and moans about the affordability now, but um we were only allowed three and a half times income on our mortgage so i had to buy with a friend we could get the deposit to be fair but the mortgage um and then as many know i bought in 93 so of course interest rates shot up you know around 15 percent and everything so um and i didn't we didn't lose on that property and again most people forget everybody a lot of people bought in the 90s bought and sold before 97 pretty much lost money um on their home and it was um uh, it was that really that started me off in property. I'd I'd realised that you had to buy somewhere and do it up, and that was the best way to guarantee you'd make some money. You build it in at the start, so um, that's what I started to do. So I was doing it in part time. So I'd go to this really kind of posh job during the day in these big head offices. Then at night I'd just go home and paint and, and strip walls and sleep on floors and stuff like that. Um, and I thought that oh, I quite like this property game. And unfortunately, like everybody else, I didn't think I'll go and buy lots of properties and keep doing them up. I decided that I was going to go and do an MBA, jack in my job, do an MBA. And then um, I was going to come in and change the way people buy and sell homes. Um, and I didn't realize that was going to be quite as difficult <laughs> as it was. But we've got quite a, a stubborn industry that doesn't really like change so much. So um, anyway, I ended up uh, during my MBA setting up um, something called a property portal. Uh, when Rightmove and Zoopla weren't a glint in anybody's eye, still had the best name. So we set it up. It's called Good Migrations. You know, I mean, we just should have won the portal war over that, to be honest. And um, we did pretty well, actually, at the start. Um, but then it was going to be impossible to compete against Rightmove, etc. Um, and then I just ended up 
sort of job um, hopping from one property company to the other. So the next one I went to, uh, who we'd met through Good Migrations, was a relocation company, and they wanted to move relocation online. So we worked with BP, Pfizer, Cadbury's, massive names, moved the relocation industry online, which went incredibly well. Um, and that was fantastic, fun, lovely company. And then they had a sister business that did part X. So I then worked growing their business. Um, and I think we got up to about buying and selling about 100 properties a year. Wow. Um, and if we bought a property in and didn't sell it out in three months, we lost money. So, oh, my God, did I get good evaluations? But I'll, I'll admit to this now because I'm older and it kind of was a long time ago. So the biggest loss I had, because it's not an easy business, um, we bought it, it was a bit of an accident. Really, we, we bought a property in for 280 and we finally sold it quite a long time later for 200. So, Kate, yeah, Kate. I know. But the amount of the rest of the money, the <laughs> I made him a lot of money. I made him an awful lot of money because uh, mostly we did quite well. Uh, but good, lovely little company, great, great boss. Um, and uh, and then I ended up um, being asked to set up a self building renovation centre in Swindon. So I kind of I just sort of hopped through pretty much every, I don't do commercial, it's residential or maybe mixed is the most I do. So I then set up a 67,000 square foot centre in Swindon. Wow. Uh, which was an incredible job. Uh, it was hard, really hard uh and um so that's kind of still there uh so that's a nice legacy to have uh, and you can still visit or go online um so i then got to know a lot about self-built construction all of that kind of thing um and then uh really i ended up doing consulting work and uh, actually um uh, was have and am still supported by um belvoir has been one of my longest running clients uh, they're actually just down the road 10 minutes down the road from where i live so um and i then just got to work as a consultant with lots of really fantastic companies and people um and um i've ended up being quite protective of the industry actually because um it gets a lot of stick uh and i have to say i've worked in pet industry i've worked in food I've worked in all sorts of places and um i think it's one of the nicest industries with some of the nicest kindest people i've ever met um and you don't often hear that and it's uh, it's important that the industry knows that it's uh, it's a lot better than it's portrayed Okay, so that's really interesting. Actually, you've got, and I want to come back to that, but you've got one of Belvoir's biggest fans on on here, Zoe by Walter. Hey. So, so nice, nice to see Stephen has a decent speaker for once. There you go. <laughs> and and also yeah. I know, and also I know, <laughs> um, you got Frank Webster, who's a massive fan as well. Yeah, um, so well, he's massive, not I'm a massive fan of them. So uh, this is, uh, that's absolutely mutual. So you talked about, um, and it's great that actually you're championing the um, industry because the industry does have a bad name. You're right. Why do you think that's the case? Why do estate agents and letting agents have such a poor name? Um, well, actually, mostly, I hate to say this, but it is its own fault. Uh, uh, and it's everybody else's fault in the industry. So if you think about the moving industry, you've got lenders, you've got brokers, legal companies, surveyors. Removal guys who nobody ever mentions, but are absolutely critical uh, to the processes we found out earlier in the year. And um, the sadness that I have is I, I'm really lucky to work with everybody in the industry, from that lender to the removal company. And there's a lot of people that work very hard to bust gut. But what we don't do is we don't sit around tables very often and talk to each other, um, hence some of the work I've been doing. And uh, the result of that is... Uh, when you when the consumer gets passed from one to the other, you tend to find that the industry isn't kind about the person you've been passed from. Oh, surveyors, oh, well, they're just covering their backs. Uh, agents, well, they'll just, they're, they're, you know, they'll be backhanders somewhere along the line. Planners always get backhanders as well, apparently. Um, and one of the problems we do have with agency is that actually we're not very good at being nice about ourselves um so i think that and i can tell you independently there's a lot of really fantastic agents legal companies surveyors um and we should really gang up on the bad guys in our industry um but i perhaps appreciate you know that there are bad people out there but there's bad journalists there's bad businessmen it's all over the place bad plumbers you name it the property industry is no worse than anybody else and 
actually, I'd love to see some stats. I'd love to see companies in it and, and the trade organisation do more to say, I probably work with more senior women than I do have in any other industry. Um, I probably see social mobility better than most other industries in our industry. If you're a good worker and you've got a good attitude and you get on with people, you'll get on and you can earn a decent living. Um, and it's those kind of things that other industries are good at championing. And quite frankly, we're rubbish. And if you don't, if you're not proud to be an agent um, and proud of and, and can talk well of your industry, um, well, you, you've got to really think about what you're doing because that we should be. You should be proud of to do. I'm really proud of we put roofs over people's heads. I think that's massive. And that's a message that isn't portrayed enough. What do you think? What do you what do you think agents can then do to change um, the opinion of the industry? And you're right. You know, there's cowboys in every industry. Um, and actually, it's the cowboys that make good news stories or bad news yeah. stories. They don't make good yeah. news stories. It's almost that the agents don't actually need to do that much more for the simple reason that I know because I've done um, uh, did, did a lot of charity work with the RSPCA. And the first people that would always put their hand in the pocket for an event we were doing or for a brochure, I used to the event we do every year down in Surrey for a brochure for that, they were the agents. Um, and uh, I would love to see, you know, the, the news guys. And I think we have seen some of this, actually. But I'd love to see somebody tot up how much money the agency industry gives back to its local communities every year. Um, and when you talk to people, and it's the same for, for landlords, letting agents and for um, estate agents, when you talk to people, they go, oh, well, my agent was fine. It's just all of the others. Um, and what I'd like to see is more of the more from the trade associations about putting out about how great their industry is. And the best example I can give you, the best, the best um, that I've seen of a turnaround. If you what do you remember the like developers and how badly thought of they were hit uh, with in the early 2000s, dreadful reputation and some pretty dreadful houses, uh, some of which are still being built. Um, but um, the House Builders Federation, oh, my word, you look at them now. What did they want? They wanted the market to open up, done, 13th of May. They wanted stamp duty, done. Uh, and then they wanted extension help to buy, done. Um, they have completely turned it around. And the way they've done it is because they have shown government how important their industry is to um, the economy, the employment levels, uh, the amount of money that it puts back. So we, I did a... Uh, a big report on housing and um, one one of the, the things that always sticks with me for every pound that's invested in a new build house it generates two pounds 83 that goes back into the local economy not disappearing into some ether into you know rich people's shareholdings or pensions back into that local economy because the guys turn up to work they build the properties um they go and shop in their local sandwich bar and all of that kind of thing and they stay locally etc so we need to have we need to shout as a home and i'd like to see it as a home moving industry not just to say as you say we employ this many people um we they are paid better than average we are better at um treating women than other people and promoting them and um we are an industry that delivers this amount back to the economy. So a pound invested in home moving delivers how many extra pounds it is. Um, and really get into MHCLG, which we've got a good relationship, I say, on the home buying selling side. We're not getting very far on the private rented sector, but uh, as, uh, not as far as I'd like. Um, so, but it would be really great to have that same level of sort of respect and that, that same level of um listening if you like to ideas that we've got um that house, house builders federation has done so it's not really at an individual agent can do it because i think all the individual agents are doing a good job i think it needs to be done at a sort of bigger level um that the home moving industry is a good industry if you choose the right people and, and that's the trick to it so should it be coming from property mark should it be coming from the rics should it be coming from the um nl na nla uh, yeah. And, you know, you met, you mentioned as well a couple of groups, so um, the home buying and selling group. 
who does that comprise of and actually there's going to be people watching here because i know we spoke beforehand that there is a home buying and selling group and there's also a lettings industry council and there's most yeah. probably eight agents and people watching this that are thinking what the hell are you talking about you know what it what is this home selling home buying and selling group um, you talk about and um, you know what is this letting industry industry council and I, I know Zoe weighs back at you and she's got a question as well but okay cool so um, the lettings industry council was set up first uh, and that was myself and uh, fantastic and I mean this is you meet individuals like this and she's amazing um, a lady called uh, Teresa Wallace who's uh, compliance um, at and more at uh, Savills and um we kind of got together and, and we we're talking about some of the issues in the lettings market and i said well look what happens when you have your meetings um as agents and uh should we don't we don't as agents i was like well, what do you mean you don't meet and i had no idea it's about four or five years ago that agents don't sit around the table and discuss their issues and discuss how best to solve them amongst themselves so that's basically how all this started um, and we started just so Teresa got some people she knew and I got some people I knew. And then we thought, well, we better. Um, I got very well with the uh, called the NRLA now, National Residential Landlords Association. So we got them in and we thought, oh, you ought to get the ombudsman in. And then I kind of thought, blimey, we better do this properly because we're starting getting complaints that people haven't been invited. And it was very informal. And basically the purpose of this and the same for the home buying and selling group is, do you know what? If we all sat around a table, everybody that's involved, tenant groups, um, industry, government, so we have MHCLG support both meetings. Um, wouldn't it be fabulous just to chat about how we could improve the private rented sector? Um, and I hope that's partly why we got the deal that we got for Roper and we got that in because that we had a, a great group, another great lady in the industry, Glynis Frew, um, CEO of Hunters. She headed up that group. Um, and rather than um, Arla, Nows and Ricks putting together three different ways of regulating agents. We put one forward. And as part of that, we then said, actually, we don't think you should just regulate agents. We should regulate properties as well. Hence the property MOT that people might have heard of. So basically, um, that group, the Lettings Industry Council, we kind of select a series of issues that we need to deal with that would make life better for consumers. But also that tends to mean for the industry. Uh, two and and especially for tenants. So um, and then we work as those group on those groups to um, try and make improvements right across the board and just reach out to anybody we need to um, uh, with often with help from MHC or G2. And then when the government a couple of years ago, I kind of really wanted the home buying and selling one because I felt we could do more. Um, and out of the two, lettings industry does talk to each other, <laughs> but the home buying and selling guys, word, it's just like. Or you're a surveyor. Oh my word! I'm an agent. We don't talk to each other, um, unless you're an RICS agent, of course. So um, I really wanted to set that up. And just as the Lettings Industry Council was working really well, and Theresa was looking after that much more uh, than and didn't need me so much, um, the government introduced its paper to make home buying cheaper, easier, um, and more cost effective, or something. Um, so they put a paper on that. Happened to be hosting a conference and. Uh, the guy who put the paper together, Matt, fantastic guy, it's a servant, Matt Pryor, he um, said to us, well, um, uh, I said, well, look, would, would you like an industry group? Would that be useful? And he was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So just at the time when the government were ready to go and try and um, get through improvements in the sector, we set up an industry group to help them. But we also... I wanted to have our own agenda as well. So we kind of, I just got a group of people I know right across the sector and says, right, let's let's work out five things that are a real pain in the neck um, are stopping us from delivering to consumers. What are the five things we need to tackle? Um, people were quite passionate about those. So unfortunately for them, I then put them as head of their, their working group, <laughs> which some of them are regretting now because it's quite a lot of work. Lesson. And they're doing it all free of charge. These are free of charge. Nobody's charging anybody. Nobody's getting paid for anything. And um, uh, and so for the last two and a half years, we've been working on trying to very closely with the government and I hope quite successfully to improve the home buying and selling um, uh, sector. And a good example of that is the guidance that was written for COVID every single day, the pub industry, schools, universities, you name it, they're all complaining about guidance. Well, our guidance was all written before the market opened. It was all agreed 
right across the whole industry, across every single sector, never had such fantastic collaborative work before. And the day that the government opened the market, which I know was just still a shock to everybody, uh, we had our own industry guidance ready to go, which matched government, so there was no conflict. Um, and then each of the sectors could develop it from there. So it made it much easier. For, and we had consumer guidance. We had three consumer checklists on the day as well. And they might seem small things, but actually during times like this, this, I think that's been pretty big. And we're building on that now and we're looking at some other things that we can be doing, um, which will hopefully be coming up in the next couple of months um, as well, um, to just try and improve the home buying and selling process. And if we can make it better for consumers, it means agents, legal companies, surveyors, they all get a better day. Um, so, you know, what, what's not to like? But we're not an official group. We're not... We have people who are one-man bands. We have consultants. We have uh, big corporates. Uh, we have the portals there. We have the on redress. Everybody in, uh, as well as MHCLG, um, and everybody pitches in um, and does does what they can to help. And um, it's it's really that's really starting to work. It's taken a little while, but I think we're getting there with that now. I mean, really, the sale process hasn't changed. Or God knows how many years, you know, and, and the days on market still takes absolutely ages. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we're in the digital world now and I'm starting to see changes of the land registry. Um, but, you know, how can it be more joined up? You know, why, you know, why does this process take so long? Because that's what makes it really stressful, you know, and, and it's for the, and the consumers are the most important people, you know, our job as you know our job as agents is obviously to facilitate help and make sure they get um the the, the roof over their head um but it just seems to be you know from an as an outsider looking in it just seems to be actually it's still as it was in the you know god well when i first started 30 odd 40 yeah. years ago so one of the drawbacks for our industry, uh, part of its own fault, part of it isn't at all, is that whenever you try and do something new, uh, somebody wants to come in and, and smack it down. Um, often that's the media, if you like. They'll they'll kind of poll in and critique anything. I've never known. I mean, if we launched, when I was doing food or in the pet industry or I haven't worked in the car industry, but it's another one that I use, they're going to launch something new oh, the media are all over it. Oh, this is fabulous. And they'll do pros and cons and they'll mark it out of 10. We do something new. We get completely slagged off for it. Um, so, and we also, as an industry, tend to fight about whether it's a good idea or not. And that doesn't help because we, we, we've got to have, we've, we've got to accept that I think the starting point in home buying and selling is we are failing. We have a 34%, 30% fall through rate after offer. That is atrocious um and it's taking 20 weeks to move home that is atrocious but blaming everybody else <laughs> is not going to work so agents blaming legal companies and surveyors and lenders well i'm sorry stop blaming them let's work out how we can fix this and one of the things that we have done and are in the process of doing is which again you might have heard of is um we have what we call one of the main reasons if we believe that 20 weeks and that fall through is high is because people don't have the information up front that they should do, whether they're buying or selling. And they're certainly not sale ready when it gets to market. Um, so we have worked with every single sector in the industry to understand what is it each of you need to know right at the start when a property is marketed to make sure that we minimize problems from start to finish. Um, and we've come up with something called the BASB, uh, Buying and Selling Property Information. And it's basically, it's no more complicated than a whole list of questions that the, the seller typically needs to fill in and some that the buyer needs. Um, and there's loads of new products and services coming out now that we hope will be able to take that forward. Um, and if we can agree all of those questions between us, and that's what we're not good at doing, but I'm pretty sure we've nailed it on this time, um, then and get that information up front. And we've got to work out how we all do that. Is that the agent's job? Is it do we get the legal guys involved earlier? And if we get the legal guys involved earlier, how do we get consumers to not think you're trying to agents trying to sell some sell legals early? Do you know what I mean? And make money that way. Um, so um, we've got to we, we, we've got to work on how we firstly get the industry to agree with each other, and we're starting to get good at that, I think. And then what we've got to work 
work out is um, can we then get the consumer buy-in and get the media behind some of these ideas rather than kind of trashing them and a good example of that for anybody who kind of thinks well what does she mean is that um the there was a criticism over um the amount of money tenants paid for rental deposits uh, and and advance so somebody comes up with what is essentially a bright idea of well rather than do a deposit why do you pay for insurance what happens completely slagged off right across the news media nobody went this is a good idea if you're in these circumstances but not such a good idea if you're in these circumstances so that is a classic case where somebody came up with a really good idea and it got by the media totally unfairly um and that's what we've we've got to we've got to break some very very big um uh, sort of barriers to making changes to how we move home um, and some of it, I'm afraid, you know, I'm wearing my consumer hat here. Consumers are really rubbish at doing it because they tell porky pies more than agents than anybody else. Consumers tell porky pies and we've got to stop them from doing that. OK, cool. so you've thrown out loads of loads of things there. Uh, so I agree 100 percent on being sale ready and buyer ready. Is there checklists um, available at the moment to help agents? You know, I know, I think Gazelle's part of your um, home buying and, and selling group. Um, is, there, is there stuff out there that um, agents can have now to be educating the consumer to be sale ready? And is there stuff that um, we or agents could be educating the buyer to be buyer ready, you know, to get that 20 weeks down, to get that 34 percent down? So at least we can start making progress now or is this something that we've got to wait um, yeah, well, to be honest, good agents do that already. So their sale fall through rate won't be 34%. Um, and why aren't you telling people? <laughs> That's my always my argument is if you've got Not a 10% great. fall through rate versus a 30%, why aren't you telling everybody about that on your first instruction? That That is like biggest news. If you've got a 10-week sales process because you're really good at your job as an agent, what, and you're good at working with the legals and surveying and you've got a fantastic sales progression department, one of the most sort of hidden and, um, uh, I, I mean, these guys to me, are the, the sales progression guys, the heroes, if you like, getting, getting it from offer to completion. It's not easy. Um, we never really talk about them as much as we should, in my view. Um, and I say that because people can say, oh, we do. Well, that's fine. But nobody, the consumers that I speak to have never heard of, heard of that kind of help. They've never heard those stats before. So if you're doing it not of the not enough of the industry um is doing it so the other things i mean you can go my consumer site is properly checklist.co.uk people love a checklist you can go on there um we produce the checklist for consumers so for example if you've got people that you're doing visits with um you've got to show people around their home or removal day there's three free checklists they're up on the home buying and selling group website we issued them out. They went out through the NEA, um, all of the different organizations. You can access those and you can give them free of charge. There's no copyright on them. We had them all ready for you to go. If you go to property checklist, there's loads of things like 15 ways to speed up the sales, pro uh, speed up your legal process, um, how to make sure your property is ready for market, etc. So I do think getting good independent advice and there's other companies so you've got property checklists you've got companies like really moving who do quite a good job um giving lots of free information um but there's also a lot of agents that do sort of first-time buyer guides those kind of things and they they help and if you don't spend any money on it quite things we did in the early days home buying we produced the um we worked with them really closely to produce the how to buy and how to sell guides and their how to lease a property that's those. Yeah, look at that. Wow. We didn't so even know that. Even. That's I, came, I, I came prepared. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was just doing some training and uh, I had that prepared <laughs> for them. So, you know, yeah. and to say but, I just come they prepared were fantastic. well, I'm not going to sell your book, but oh. here you go as well. That's there right. Paul's bit, really. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, you know, but there is, you know, I'm sure if you approach Paul and you asked him for a deal on his books and you handed those out. You know, we're friends to the industry. We're not telling you we're, we're actually in that, but we will mostly tell people they should use an agent. And I'm, uh, again, if anybody's on and you want to sort of talk to landlords, I'm like, if you're working full time, 
uh, and you're not working in the property industry, don't even think about letting a property yourself. You'd be as mad as a box of frogs. Make sure you get Arla Rick's agent on board um, to look after you. So, you know, you can you can quote me on that with, with pleasure um, because it's, it's essential. So many landlords get themselves into such a pickle. Um, and with the huge fines that are around, it's one thing I do write about a lot. If you if you like tweeting and stuff like that, every time there's a local fine for a landlord, tweet it, put it out on social media, tell you next on your next instruction, bring it up. Um, it's all about the legals in lettings for me to, and you're better at this now to get instructions. But a big part of it is just quite rightly to some extent scaring the living daylights out of them about the legal side because it is nuts. There you go, great. So we're joined by Watford Royalty today, Mike Day. So oh. top lady, I'm a, I'm a participant in the Home Buying and Selling Group. Agents and others have a lot of, of the answers in their own hands, just need to put more, more effort into convincing consumers. So yeah. again, you know, how can you convince the consumers? You know, what um, all the agents watching this, whether it's on lettings or sales, you know, how do they get the message out? You keep on talking about the negative media. Um, how can we put some more, um, some positive um, stuff out there? You know, if I'm an agent in Watford um, or Bedford, how do we get the message out there that, you know, we are good agents, we are doing good stuff um, yeah. and you should be using us? So the first, effectively, that's what I do because I, I have to get people's trust. And the one problem that we have is they will trust the media and what they say and they'll trust their friends and family more than they'll trust agents and initially myself. But the first thing that I do when I talk to anybody in uh, be they an investor or be it somebody buying or selling is I explain to them exactly why they should ignore all the media information on property prices and rents. And um, you'll see in the negotiator, and I hope this is of help to people, every month we do um, a summary of all of the different reports. Um, so that's like a two minute read. And you know exactly the headlines of what all of the reports are putting it out. You take last month when everybody was just like running around. Um, I'm not going to say like headless chickens because you couldn't have done. You had to be on your, you had to be on your game for the last few months. Um, the, even the BBC, much as I love them when I was on there this morning, um, they put out a headline which said, house prices fall for the first time in eight years. So my next presentation was that headline. Guardian, who always write badly about property anyway, they don't like anybody in property, even in social housing, don't like them either. And uh, uh, house prices fall for fourth month in a row. So that was Halifax and the, the BBC one was a, a nationwide. The, the BBC one was based on a 0.1% fall based on data during lockdown, year on year. Seriously? And you're not going to trust me as an agent over prices, but you're going to trust the BBC telling you first house price fall in eight years based on a 0.1% fall. That should never, ever have been allowed to make a headline. The four month falls on um, Halifax. Just tell everybody, just ignore monthly data. It's utter rubbish. I've been working with it 15 years. Never trust it. It's only used to looking back or from an analysis perspective. But the land registry, for example, if they put out their monthly data and it says Nottingham's down by 2% this month, by the end of the next month, when they get all the data in, Nottingham could be plus 2%. So month on month data is rubbish. Year on year is interesting. But the agents have so much better data because you have the price inflation of the last 20 odd years for their property on their road. For the one they're buying and the one they're selling. You know what the newspapers are telling them because it's being put out there in the media. So you just basically go across and you say, right, this is what the media is saying on prices. By the way, this is what's actually happening in East Midlands, in Nottinghamshire and Nottingham City. Um, but I've looked at prices on your road and actually you've got a really beautiful house in the park um, in Nottingham and your prices are going up. Or unfortunately, um, you've got a flat that was bought 15 years ago. You paid quite a lot of money for it. And I'm afraid it's worth 20 grand less than it was before. Um, and if nothing else, you suddenly get their trust. And as soon as you've got their trust, then you can start walking them through all of the other things. So on average, uh, it takes uh, about a third of 
properties sales fall through. Well, mine's this. Uh, it takes 20 weeks. Well, mine's this. Um, there was a great, one of the best agents I've worked with, and I've, and I've worked with loads of them, but what they used to do every single year was go through every single stat and just try to improve it a little bit. A bit like them. You remember when we became the world bike champions and it was because we were making these little Mar things. margin marginal yeah. gains. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about that. And then it's about telling everybody about it. Um and being honest about it. Put your stats up on your website. Why not? You know, um and never ever I had a I did have a big well known agent uh sold my mum's house a few years ago and uh, they walked in and they'd undervalued it by 100 grand because they hadn't bothered to look at the sale price of the property next door and i kicked their butt big time and i told them how much they'd let their company down and how dare they um so he went oh, he went with a right flea in his ear i've never seen anybody go quite so red but shameful for doing that um and he just he was just arrogant uh and he was cocky um and he didn't quite realize what he was walking into um, and it backfired badly. And that's what you've got to always think is, you know, you don't know. Somebody could be, I, the amount of people I deal with behind the scenes who are, you know, journalists and they've been so badly treated by the industry, like some idiot, you know, not thinking. You've got to always walk in thinking this is, this is, um, uh, I don't know, a watchdog, somebody sitting in a watchdog. You've got to, got to always walk into something and just be honest, gain their trust. House prices and rents are really, really good topic to talk about and you've got that individual sole property price data which most consumers don't know exist it's amazing never seen it before they think yours they think i'm a super god when i present this data because they think it's amazing it's there it's free of charge we've had it for how long what 15 years 10 years but they they, they don't know it exists and you've got it all in the palm of your hand how amazing is that incredible right let's go and answer some questions because i'm grateful for oh. your time and um right so um zoe so coming back what can we do to lobby the mhclg is there a way to get our um, voices heard so i think i'm thinking more and more that really what we need to start thinking about is um and i don't know how we kind of start doing this is is home moving as kind of one industry and we're kind of doing that because because i've got obviously set up the TLC to start off in the home buying selling group we we share what we're doing and we we're, we always keep in keep keep each other in touch and I'm on and I'm, myself and others are on both groups so I think we've got to get smarter at um lobbying really MHCLG but also I think we've got to get better at communicating with consumers as well um and for me that's got to be a joint thing going in just as the NEA, uh, and I don't mean that disrespectfully or as property mark, but we've got to go in with these huge numbers of people that we employ, with this huge amount of money that we deliver to the economy. Definitely that House uh, Builders Federation strategy. Um, if we could get the respect that they have and the understanding of the difference we can make. But what I have to say is we've all got to get on and we can't have any infighting between us. Um, we've got to all get behind the consumer and moving home and not it's so-and-so's fault or it's so-and-so's fault. And we're still a little bit sometimes in that um, in that vein, I think. And we've got to, we've got to really move past that um, to make ourselves credible, uh, more credible, really, uh, with MHCLG. And if people want to come on to, I mean, the Home Buying and Selling Group or the Letting Industry Council and support it, is there... Is there ways of agents on here that can do that? Um, yeah, so basically get in touch. One of the, I will highlight one of the kind of things that we never thought would be a problem is we'd have so many people want to participate. Um, and we don't say we've got members or anything because we're not a member organisation. And you, if you're not a member, you're not a bad person and vice versa. If you're a member, you're not a brilliant person and vice versa. So um, it's very much about... so. If you can make the meetings great we only have about four a year a lot of them will be online now and that might be might be a better way for us to move forward so i've got to learn really from I used to hate online meetings but I, I quite like them because i can do them as i am now with my feet up on my settee and it's quite nice uh so um it 
it's about so we do obviously produce all the minutes and everything if you've got ideas or if you've got things you'd like to change that's fine we do put out um, i don't like to call them press releases because it makes them bigger than they are really we do put out communication so we've put out the home buying selling group about the bass fee we put out about the reservation agreement we put out about the on the tlic about the property mot for example um so we've put that out and it's about getting involved and getting feedback from you um that that's really really important and then if there's anything you think is holding the industry back or where we're failing consumers let us know and we'll we'll see how we can do it and you can always join the working groups because they always need people to help um there's a lot of people it's quite a condensed number of people doing a lot of work at the moment and as as these the momentum grows we're going to need we're going to need more people to uh, pitch in okay lovely so you talked about um property mot for rentals um chris has asked can you tell us a bit more about that yeah definitely and um again I'll, I'll pass the after we've done this i'll pass the two websites over to you but the property mot is sitting up on their lettings industry council website um and um so you can download it uh, you can use it if you want there's no reason why you can't use it and the idea as i say it said earlier was that um we didn't feel that um, just regulating the agents was enough. If you think about it, there was a brilliant, if you ever want to read the best report on the private rented sector and what we could do to change it, it's a report by um, Judy Rugg and one of her colleagues uh, through the Nationwide Foundation. Absolutely awesome report. Government don't know why they've completely ignored it, but they pretty much have, which is a huge shame. Um, but I'm, I'll still battle on to them about it. Um, but... Um, She's quite supportive of the property MOT. And when the data in her report tells us that, and it's not necessarily the best definition, but let's run with the stats we have. Two out of 10 properties in the Northeast are, uh, have at least a category one hazard. So 20%, you've got a one in five chance of renting a poor property uh, that's being illegally let probably in the Northeast. In, in the West Midlands, it's four 4.5 out of 10 properties. You've got 45% chance. How many of those properties are appearing on Right Move and Zoopla that are being let at the category one hazard? You'd hope a lot less than that because they are taking agents' properties, not necessarily direct from landlord. But we don't know. And I've seen some very dodgy pictures on, on those websites. So, um, for what we have to do is we have to, at the moment, the only recourse we've got for poorly let properties that aren't, uh, aren't safe and legal, Habitation Act, well, nobody's going to really, no tenant's going to, unless they're well off, take their landlord to court, unless it's social housing, probably, it's going to hit them harder. Um, and um, the, the other thing you've got is you've got retaliation eviction. Well, that's not done anything so far. Um, but what we could do, is we could scrap licensing, which also has just cost a huge amount of money, taking up huge amounts of admin time on councils that they're not going to have for the future, and just say to everybody, do you know what? Here's a little three page. It's a property MOT. It tells you it's legally and safely let, and you're not allowed to advertise on any of the portals without one. How much easier? Do you try and imagine? How do I explain to a tenant, don't take a property if it's got damp or mold or slippery stairs or whatever but if i can say to them you know what you don't buy a car without an mot don't rent a house without one either and if we could get every if we could really get the government behind that which you're struggling with or we just say to the industry do you know what can you just implement this and say to the portals can you do the same we don't need government potentially to do this we could do it ourselves but it takes a little bit of guts to do it if you like and and it's a big leap of faith i suppose um but i think we can take more into our own control than we sometimes think um and it'd be really great to see the property mot take off um as I say with or without government support and if that we get if it could get rid of licensing i'm all for it i think licensing is a, is a is a bad idea um and done well in some areas but done poorly in most okay lovely and, and zoe's asked roper or property mot's or both and when uh, so both and yesterday, please. <laughs> right. So um, I don't know how you beat up a government for not doing something, but I'm <laughs> I'm researching it um, because actually the sad thing is all these laws that they've introduced to help tenants 
and they're still complaining everything's like the Wild West. And it's like, well, if you'd regulated agents 25 years ago like they'd asked for, you wouldn't have this flipping mess in the first place. Um, and we need to get people. I mean, people like Shelter, I can't see them shouting for it. Have a go at letting agents for discrimination when we all know that's a problem with universal credit, not the agent or landlord. Um, but where's their, where's their chanting? It's the biggest roper would be the best thing for tenants ever and for landlords because it provide it'll provide consistency and at the moment the government supports the bad guys and i do tell them this but if i go to joe blogs down the road from zoe or frank um and they tell me uh, they, they say to me oh we'll do it for like commission five percent commission we'll rent your property um and i say to them oh but zoe and frank have said i've got to get a new fuse box in and i've got to get this electrical safety certificate and gas and i've got to do all this stuff and Joe Bloggs just says, nah, you don't have to bother with that. They're just charging you huge prices as a result. What defence have you guys got against that? The government's not been fair. Um, and um, that's why we fought. For, that's how we fought for this in the, in the first place. Um, and it's the biggest, it would do more for them. When I do research with the agents I work with, the chance you're getting evicted if you're with a good agent is about zero. Literally about zero. So why isn't shelter, why isn't the government absolutely going, oh, my word, we've got to get regulation in? Because if we could bring everybody up to the great standard of the good guys, we'd wipe out most of the problems in the PRS. But it's a hard, yeah, I, I don't know why we can't get them to listen, but we've got them this far. So we're just going to have to be uh, patient, I guess, at the moment. And, and um, I don't have to be patient, though. I am pushing very hard. <laughs> Good. And if there's anybody who will get it and push them, it's going to be Kate Faulkner. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so Jason said, education is key with a thorough understanding of a process, offering to help vendors understand forms such as the BSPI or TA forms will be welcome with open arms and will give an agent a key differentiator. Not only that, the agent will be able to inform the sales progress of potential issues i.e. new windows without a fencer certificate before the buyers conveyance and finds them in week 10. So proactive measures such as indemnity policies um, can be put in place. Here you go, Christopher Watkin. Kate is a star. So, uh, <laughs> oh, there we go. So Chris and one, I go one, way back. <laughs> yeah. So one final question, um, yeah. and really uh -huh. grateful. Thank you for your time. Is how do agents get to understand their local economy? Um, too many take the generic property news stories and apply them without thought to their own market. However, the reality on the ground is usually much different, and this can make a real difference to your business and value that can be added to customers. So I think you covered that before, actually, about making it in your street. But um, is there anything else you can add to that? Yeah, so um, there's an amazing amount of information out. The first thing is I would love every single property professional to not be allowed out in the morning unless you've read your local plan, which tells you what's going to happen in your local area in the next five years what's going to be built, where they're going to build it, what your population is now, what it's going to be in the next five, ten years, uh, where they're going to put new roads, um, what your average income is, because um, if you know your average income, you've got a good idea as to, and you know your average income is going up, for example, you can know you can raise rents. If your average income is going to down, go down, that's going to struggle, and you get, need to let your landlords know in good time that they're going to have to be a bit keener on rents like they are going to likely to be this year. Um, so it's all the stuff at the end of the day, you put a roof over your head by through employment or indeed unemployment. So universal credit now for any agent that isn't. And I understand why you, you might not want to let to people on universal credit, but actually the risk of somebody privately losing their job after furlough versus somebody not getting paid on universal credit, it's probably made there a little bit more of a match. Um, so um, it's about really understanding, and certainly for the next 12 months, economically, how hard is your area going to be hit? Who are your biggest employers? Because quite a lot of them probably will be hospitals, in which case you're going to be just fine. Um, but if it's catering and hospitality, you're going to have a tough time. But the lovely thing about property is if they're not buying, they're renting. So what's your strategy going to be when somebody's lost their job and they're about to lose their home? What can you do to help that person? And what ready made package have you got to make sure they either don't lose their home because you can help them with the mortgage payment? Um, uh, bad word of holidays, but uh, um, 
deferral um, or indeed you can maybe help them let that property um, and move somewhere else until they get another job and they can recover so and what do you, you know if somebody's selling the house and they um, uh, they need to get divorced or whatever one of the big things in the last um, recession was um, people having to stay together for four or five years because they couldn't sell the home well what what strategy are you going to have for them? What strategies are you going to have for tenants that can't afford the place they've got now? What can you do to help them move somewhere cheaper? What can you do to help work with the council to make sure they don't end up homeless, but your landlord still get paid? It's all about looking at thinking ahead for the next 12 months. Every single problem that's going to come through your door, how do you turn that? And I know it's a bit naff, but how do you turn that into an opportunity? Because at the end of the day, we can, because somebody's always going to need a roof over their head. So there's, there's always business there. It's massively about trying to work out how hard are you going to be hit over the next 12 months and therefore what strat new ways of working you're going to have to do. But how can you help people? Because, there's, you know, people are stressed about property when often they don't need to be. Um, there are always ways of sorting it out. Well, that's your job to do it. And if that's going and getting them on the universal credit because they've been sacked after furlough's gone, then that's your job. Go and do that. Um, and that might sound like me asking too much you do that for that person that person's going to love you for life and tell all their mates about you and it'll be the cheapest piece of marketing you've ever done in your entire life what a brilliant way to end thank you <laughs> um chris watkin i can't thank kate enough for the help and guidance she's given me over the years um well, zoe the same so thank you thank everybody for watching um yeah, thank you so much, pre pre Appreciate your time, whether you're watching now or whether you're watching on replay. Kate, thank you so much for giving up your time and your lunch and your dog Good. walking for, Dal for Dalmatian <laughs> um, to spend 50 minutes with um, the audience here. Really, really grateful. So everybody, um, have a great Tuesday afternoon. Thursday, I'm going to be joined by um, my partner in crime, or one of my partners in crime, on the Estate Agents podcast, Luke Sinclair, who's going to share all his um, learnings about his trips to ARIC and America um, and the conferences there and Tom Ferry. So thanks very much. Thanks for watching. Have a great afternoon. And thanks again, Kate. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. See you, everybody. Cheerio.